live from the Mandalay Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's The Cube at IBM Insight 2014. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Hello, everyone. We are here live in Las Vegas. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier. With my co-host Dave Vellante, for the next two days, we'll be wall-to-wall -wall coverage for IBM Insight, IBM's premier show around big data, big data analytics, and how that's disrupting and transforming social business engagement, and mainly cloud, mobile, and social infrastructure and applications. Uh, Dave and I will be, we'll be talking to all the top guests, top executives. We have Steve Mills coming on today, analyst Ray Wang from Constellation Group, and a variety of experts and practitioners. And of course, we are live on the ground in Las Vegas, here at the Mandalay Bay uh, Convention Hall within the casino. Inside the IBM Social Lounge, Go Insight is their brand. Um, they have a special new digital experience, kind of a second screen, if you will, and the cube is here headlining that event. And also check out uh, IBM Insight, I Insight Go. They have great celebrities like Veronica Belmont, who's here, um, kind of kind of curating and co-hosting, playing DJ to the social crowd of influencers, and we're going to have some of those folks on as well. Um, and mainly, the, the, the goal is to bring a digital experience, and IBM really is leading this transformation with technology in the cloud, technology for mobile, and more importantly, their expertise in software and analytics, and we saw some amazing keynotes this morning. Inhi Chu uh, Sa was on stage, CUBE alumni, talking about really the most important aspect of this new software resolution, that's the data impact. They announced DataWorks, they announced uh, DashDB from the cloud and acquisition, and a variety of other things, really talking about the technologies under the hood powering this next generation of software around big data and Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is not just computers and machines and probes and sensors, it's people too, and that's mobile connected device. Uh, Dave, I want to get your thoughts on this because uh, this is our, our wheelhouse, you know, and last year I was looking at the videos from IBM IOD, Information On Demand, which now the show's renamed uh, Insight, which really kind of brings together the, the business outcomes aspect on the business model side, but also focuses on the technology, where you see Watson at the center of the value proposition. You're seeing software as a key component. So, um, your thoughts, IOD, now called Insight, here are the keynotes, what's your thoughts? Well John, let me start with the uh, event itself. So, IOD was a collection of IBM's analytics business, it's old Cognos business, maybe some information management thrown in, it was a sort of a strange compendium of different businesses within IBM. When the big data meme hit, IBM looked at that as an opportunity to, as I said before, super glue its analytics business to that big data theme. Redefine what big data is. In other words, transcending just Hadoop. Of course, we were at Big Data NYC last week, a lot of Hadoop talk, a lot of elephant in the room, a lot of NoSQL, which we still believe is the mainspring of big data. But nonetheless, IBM's perspective is that Big data transcends Hadoop, and then it's got a zillion examples of that. And certainly, its software business and its analytics business underscore that. As well, the Watson business came in, and they've tied that into the IOD, what is now the IBM Insight theme. And so really, IBM has become a leader in that marketplace, a thought leader in analytics, and this is really one of the biggest big data shows. Now, of course, it's bringing together a lot of traditional uh, whether it's data warehousing or business intelligence activities with the new big data, cla you know, classical Hadoop type uh, businesses. IBM, as you know, has a huge portfolio, John, of all these different businesses and has really rebranded and has done a very, very good job there. The challenge I see that IBM faces is IBM's in transition. It's quote unquote old businesses are declining quite quickly and it's new businesses aren't yet large enough to offset those declines. So last quarter, it's obviously well reported, seven, eight days ago, IBM reported uh, a, a big miss uh, and that's been in the news, the stock took a big hit and Ginny Rometty came out and said, we didn't execute well, we have to accelerate the transition to the new businesses. What are those new businesses? Well, it's cloud, it's analytics, uh, it's things, vertical businesses around things like Watson, uh, certainly big data, and engagement. And you've heard a lot today at the keynotes around cloud engagement and of course data analytics. As I said, IBM's big challenge in, during that transformation is that the new stuff isn't big enough, John, to offset the decline in the old stuff. 
Yeah, Dave, I think it's right on it. Let's talk about the IBM situation. Obviously, they got hammered in the news, and yeah, they really took, a, uh, took it on the chin. And you know, I, I was commenting on Twitter and on crowd chats that you know, IBM really was unwarranted. I mean, we've been covering a lot of the IBM shows now going on our fourth year here with theCUBE. We've been on the ground. We've been embedded, almost embedded, inside IBM during this transformation. We saw them make their moves. Certainly, we just recently reported at a recent event around their uh, divestiture of the um, uh, Intel server chips, low-end servers, and really focusing on the power rate um, here uh, within IBM. And here's why I think IBM is, is not going to go anywhere uh, soon in terms of being extinct. And a lot of people were trashing IBM saying, hey, you know, you know the stock buybacks were not in concern. Let me, let, me, let me address that. I mean, this is my take on stock buybacks. Stock buybacks are a financially engineering uh, uh, tactic for companies to build back the stock when they think there's value. And they buy back that stock to control the float. The float is the number of shares available in the market. And this is a standard tactic of a lot of companies. During transitional markets, they buy back the stock, they buy back that stock because they want to control the float and manage the hedge funds and all the arbitrage folks out there that are trading IBM not for long-term value but for short-term gains. And we've seen companies like Michael Dell, a Dell computer go private. IBM can't go private, but what they can do is control their float. That's a completely separate issue from the fact that IBM has been retrenching in all aspects of their business. And I think certainly the margin uh, expansion question, we've asked Steve Mills that direct question, is a legitimate question. I think that is something that they need to look at. And certainly the cloud technologies puts pressure on those margins, no doubt. However, the companies that will be successful in the future, in our opinion, in theCUBE, and through the research we've done at Wikibon, is software drives margins, and that is classic business. Now, they're a little bit late to the game with uh, cloud, they got soft layer, they got Bluemix booting up, but they have Watson, and they have a very robust, mature software business. They're getting rid of the boxes, and there's really going to be two types of companies, in my, my opinion, in the future that will be very, very successful. Those with software that rely on hardware, and those guys are going to be fighting and holding on <laughs> because they got to carry that hardware. And folks who have just software. So IBM is moving to a point where, yeah, they'll have some gear, but more importantly, the value creation will be on the software side. So I believe that IBM is perfectly positioned around, not just the messaging, but they've been delivering on it. You look at their announcements, you will see database as a service, that's the cloud and acquisition. Um, Dash TV, you got Watson at the centerpiece, and a lot of people are like, you know, criticizing Watson, it's not happening fast enough, but that's very complicated, it's very much a broad uh, technology. So IBM really is taking it on the chin uh, in the short term, but I think if they stay the course, Dave, I think that's going to be fundamentally the thing that we're going to watch. If they start you know, body swerving to appease the market, then they're going to be in a death spiral, in my opinion. They can't do that. They got to stay on their mission. They have great messaging. They're on a right vector into what we believe is the right marketplace. We've been saying this for three years, cloud, mobile, and social. And certainly, they're going to have to take it in the shorts, on margin, in the short term. But I think they're moving quickly in the software. Your take on that. Well, I'm going to start with the stock buybacks. You're right, a lot of people will criticize that. But if a company's not willing to buy its own stock, uh, the street will punish you. Um, I go back to the early 1990s when IBM was under this big downsizing <clears throat> head, headwind and pressure shifting to microprocessor based systems, which are much lower margin. What IBM did at the time to forestall that, that decline was they essentially transitioned their rental base to purchase. So IBM played a financial engineering game and really aggressively started to take the, what was a monthly revenue, deferred revenue model, which was renting mainframes largely, and transitioning those to a, to a purchase. Uh, and that took you know, a couple of years, many, many months, and over, over a multi-year period, and it was able to keep IBM propped up. It was sort of a, a financial masking of the decline. And in some ways, IBM did some similar moves with the stock buybacks, very aggressive stop, stock buybacks. Having said that, if you don't buy back your stock these days with your excess cash, the street will punish you. Now, the, the big question, and you look, of course, John, you look at somebody like Yahoo, where uh, you know, Marissa Meyer bought back a lot of stock and that worked out very well. So the question is, will those continue? Um, and so, and, and I think in some regards they have to. Of course, it does drain free cash flow. I think the big headwind that IBM has is its transition in its, in its major businesses. Revenue was down 4%, it was down 2% in constant currency this last quarter. Services was, was down 3% down flat in constant currency. The, the, the systems and technology group, the hardware group was way down. Mainframes were way down. Power was way down. Storage was way down. So you're seeing multiple double digit declines. IBM will point to things like Flash, 
which were growing, but Flash is not nearly big enough to offset those major declines. Power, power 8, which is ostensibly a growth area, you know, down in, in the business. IBM is jettisoning its uh, System X business, selling that to Lenovo. Uh, it's getting out of the microelectronics business, essentially having an acquisition, i.e. paying, to get to have somebody uh, take that business, Global Foundries, um, and essentially it's got a number of vertically integrated business units that it's launching. Things like cloud, security, smarter commerce, Watson, uh, Tivoli was a bright spot, up 3% in the quarter, uh, WebSphere was up, but again, those businesses not nearly large enough to offset the decline. What and about, what about I'll add to that, uh, unlike HP, e EMC, uh, a lot of these companies that we see uh, uh, in, you know, struggling a little bit, free cash flow is flat. So that's a, that's a bit of a concern, that IBM's not generating as much free cash flow as it has in the past. What about services, Dave? We talk about services all the time. IBM really kind of rebounded with, with, um, during the transition when their first major turnaround, kind of they had their Meg Whitman moment you know, almost a decade ago or more, where the IBM services really led the charge on that. So what's your take on that now? Certainly a little bit of mix, you got some product leadership going on. Uh, what's your take on that? Are they poised to be the IBM global services king? And can they rely on that? Is it a crutch? Is it an opportunity? Are they lagging? Are they winning? What's your take? Well, a lot of the global services business, John, was outsourcing. And outsourcing was a my mess for less. And IBM dominated that business. The acquisition of PwC was one of the, one of the best acquisitions ever in the history of the computer industry. I'll put it, I'll put it close to, but, but somewhat behind, obviously VMware, but right up there. It really helped transition IBM into a global services powerhouse. Lou Gerstner made that decision you know, a decade plus ago and said, we will have a single throat to choke. We're not going to go optimize on the product level and sell different points of entry into the customer. We're going to have a single point of entry into the customer, and that obviously worked very well for IBM. The trade-off is now it's coming to roost, right? You, you, it's hard to pick a product where IBM is actually dominant with the exception of mainframes. And so, you know, Oracle got the lead. Well, the cloud, is, the cloud is a mainframe, but I want to bring up the services piece of the cloud. Agile is something that's been a technical term moving into the business landscape, where agile is about business outcomes. And you're seeing the cycle times of deployment really shortening up there. Buy by the drink, land and expand. This is the new business model of dynamics we're seeing with cloud and mobile infrastructure. Certainly security, perimeterless security is a, is a hot focus. So IBM kind of has all the software products. They have a good arsenal of products in their, uh, in their bag, if you will. But does that impact services as a create uh, an undervalued services infrastructure in terms of deploying with people and resources? Or are they good? Well again, IBM made the bet. Uh, on services to become a leader. And uh, the, the economics of services are, are different than the economics of certainly hardware products and software products. But IBM has done a great job, uh, certainly within software. I mean, Steve Mills, we're going to have on later, led the, the architecture of I, the IBM software group and completely transformed that business. IBM decided many, many years ago that the growth areas were in services and software and it bet heavily on those. Now, it, it, you know, look at IBM's business today, IBM's certainly de-emphasizing hardware. It's made, in fact, Steve Mills uh, two months ago in Greenwich, speaking to a bunch of analysts, put forth some, some metrics where it used to be over half the business in the IT business was, was hardware-based, and IBM's business was largely you know, a hardware-based business. That's transitioned dramatically. So IBM made those bets on software and services, but you know, it's coming back, John, and started to be integrated. And, and I think that IBM's still trying to figure that out, organizationally, uh, product-wise, the portfolio. And I have a, you know, some pretty strong opinions on, frankly, how that should be organized that we can talk about today. Well, I mean, one of the things I think about IBM is that, uh, that I'm really impressed in is that you heard the keynote um, uh, on stage this morning after Inhe, which was an awesome at keynote. Um, at the TED at IBM event in San Francisco where Inhe Chusa gave a keynote about data, kind of a thought leader event, she nailed, in my opinion, what was one of the most critical aspects of this big data world. That is active data. Active data is the holy grail for mobile infrastructure, mobile data, having databases to service. These are the kinds of things that are, uh, that are not kind of new concepts, but from a practice standpoint, it's moving from the developer world to the business world. That's one thing, so you're thinking active data. Every business has active data. Two, they talk about engagement, systems of engagement. That's a data warehousing term, we heard that before. 
but engagement goes well beyond just data warehousing, database storage. Engagement gets now into the customer interaction piece. This to me is where the internet of things model, where people are things too, become really, really critical. You're going to start to see in the moment program. You're going to see, start to see leveraging of their live events, immersion, immersive experiences, where IBM can enable their customers to be more engaging with their customers. And that's going to be around social media and social business. I think IBM is the leader in social business, without a doubt. They talk about engagement, they talk about these things. And Dave, go back to the web when we were breaking into the business there during the web day, web transformation. IBM pioneered a concept called e-business. Okay, we don't talk about e-business anymore because all business is e-business today. But IBM really was a leader in that space. We saw what they did in the web. I'm seeing the same thing going on with social media. Social business is real. This is not a gimmick. It's not a PR thing with social media. Social media is how people are talking. They're talking to themselves. It's a crowdsource dynamic. So the notion of systems of engagement will basically be a complete end-to-end -end phenomenon to write to the customer, write to people. So that's going to impact and transform advertising, their customer service, and more importantly, their customers on how they engage with their, with their customers. So I think IBM's big opportunity here, John, is to have these vertically integrated business units that take into account infrastructure as a service, security, you know, bringing the cloud, bringing data in, and actually helping clients transform. I mean, you know, in, in some respects, let Amazon own the startups, I and mean, sure, you know, uh, uh, SoftLayer has you know, plenty of startups, but really I think IBM's big play here, John, is helping the UPS's of the world, the Coca-Cola's, the McDonald's, their, their big banks, the financial institutions, the insurance companies, those big companies that are under pressure from all these disruptive startups, help them transition to this new world and take advantage of this new digital matrix that's emerging where you have cloud as the, you know, the bottom layer, you've got security, you've got systems of engagement, and on top of that, you've got this transport of data and analytics. And putting that all together is a very complicated piece. Security is a big part of that. IBM can help its large Fortune 1000 customers transition. Yeah. And that's really where and the I play think, is. I think the cloud transition, IBM has been criticized for being late to the party there. They've certainly been full throttled acquisitions. We saw the soft layer acquisition on bare metal back into the cloud. Amazon is certainly changing the game, but I think it's bigger than Amazon. I think IBM realizes that cloud is going to be killer and they're, and they're building out as fast as they can. So I don't think they're going to lose a lot. Just like we talk about EMC with storage. I mean, like, you know, a lot of people have come along to try to knock EMC off, but they have the customer relationships. IBM has the relationships, so if they can tool up and build that out their capabilities, they will win. Now, my only concern about IBM's cloud strategy really comes down to this. This is something more of that we could debate on theCUBE you know, throughout the day, but that is this. IBM, HP, EMC, you name it, they need their own cloud. I mean, I believe that um, we're going to go to a multi-cloud world, permitless IT, and DevOps kind of ethos driving this new generation. It's going to change the economics, it's going to change the customer experiences from social engagement to how they roll out their supply chain, et cetera. So, that being said, I believe that IBM needs to own their own cloud. Without a doubt, HP, the big guys, are, are, are must have their own cloud because Amazon has a cloud, they have their own cloud. Because look at OpenStack. OpenStack is clearly consolidating around we don't want a little piece of the pie here. We want building blocks, that's all great, kumbaya, rah, rah, but you're seeing the big guys roll in because there's some serious business at stake, and if they don't have their own clouds, Dave, I really believe that they need to, they're going to be out of the well, game. Well, I think they do have their own cloud. The issue to me, John, is top line growth and the enterprise margin premiums, which are, you know, the 10X markup over the core technology, whether it's a microprocessor, a disk drive, or some infrastructure as a service. And that's the big challenge for all of these companies. That's, frankly, John, that's why they embrace hybrid cloud, because hybrid cloud is not, frankly, disruptive to their business model. <laughs> so, the top line growth and the enterprise margin uplift is a real challenge for all of these guys. Well, we're excited to be here live in Las Vegas, the social lounge here. Uh, Inside Go is the location, and we're bringing all the live to live coverage, and Dave, you know, just wrapping up our intro segment, it's very clear the trajectory of this business. Customers need to create their own systems to integrate data, always changing data, new data, old data. At the end of the day, the role of the organization and what they deliver to their customer in terms of value is going to come down to how they handle their data and their applications, and that's something that we really care about. We're going to explore more of that here at IBM Insight. We are live on the ground. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back after this short break.